Hey everyone, and welcome to the Uncorked Corner podcast, where we cover the full spread of food and beverage industry topics. My name is Bianca, PR and marketing professional by day and food and wine connoisseur by night. And my name is Nick, an accountant with a passion for barbecue, beer, and whiskey. Today, we welcome back New England-based author J.M. Hirsch. J.M. is here to talk to us about his new book, Shake, Strain, Done. In this episode, J.M. takes us through the theory behind cocktail making, the significance of glassware in your home bar, and some of the surprising cocktail ingredients and methods used in his cocktail recipes. The book is available today everywhere that you can find your books, uh, Barnes & Noble's, Amazon, etc. We'll include links in the description, but it's November 3rd is when it becomes available. That's when we're posting this episode, so if you're listening to it, get on there, buy the book, so you can make these awesome cocktail recipes at home. And if you enjoy this podcast, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to us. With that said, let's welcome JM back to the show. Welcome back to the show. We are so excited to have J.M. Hirsch returning uh, with an introduction to his latest book, Shake Strain Done. So we'll have you reintroduce reintroduce yourself really quick, and then we'll get into all the details. Sounds good. Uh, so yeah, J.M. Hirsch. I am the editorial director of Christopher Kimball's Milk Street, which is a food media company based in Boston. We have a TV show, magazine, books, radio show, cooking school, all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, but basically, I get paid to travel the world and eat and drink and bring it back to share with our audience. <laughs> that's the that's the quick version. All right. So we're here today to talk about your new bro- book. Uh, we talked about some of your old ones and your history and everything before. So if you haven't listened to that podcast yet, go check that out. Um, so tell us the title of your new book and take us through sort of the journey behind writing that. And uh, what was the inspiration behind it? Yeah, so it's Shake, Strain, Done, Craft Cocktails at Home. And the inspiration came from, well, I, as I said, you know, I, 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 it's, it's an awful job, I know. I get paid to travel the world and eat and drink. And when I do, you know, my favorite thing in every city is to check out the very best bars. And I go to the bar, I sit at the bar, and I just interrogate the bartenders. And I learn so much and, and just enjoy these amazing cocktails. The problem is it's really hard to bring that stuff home because the the level at which they're working, it just doesn't translate to the home bartending. We don't have 30 gins to call on. We don't have a hundred different whiskeys and you know these infusions that we spend a week or months creating. And so it's frustrating because you have these great drinks and then you can't recreate them at home. And so the more I thought about it, and frankly, the more I learned from these people while I was traveling, uh, I realized that it would be possible to to try to distill down the essence of what they're doing, the bold flavors, the different types of ingredients, the kind of unexpected flavors and textures uh, that they combine in drinks. It would be possible to distill down some of that in a format that is more approachable for, for home. And so when I set to writing the book, I kind of set out a a handful of guidelines for myself. The first one was I wanted it to really focus on a limited repertoire of liquors. You know, again, it's like it's wonderful to go to a great bar and be able to choose from 30 different gins, but that's just not practical at home. And so I wanted just a kind of a core set of liquors from which you could build all sorts of amazing cocktails. So that was, the, that was the first thing. The second thing is I wanted all the cocktails to be built using just common equipment and, and easy techniques. You know, the, the good thing about home bartending as a hobby is that it, you know, it doesn't cost a lot of money to equip your bar with a decent set of what you need to make just about any cocktail. And, and so you don't need a whole lot of fancy equipment. The third, thing, and probably the most important thing for me, is I wanted to use a language around cocktails that you can taste. You know, my writing background obviously came through here. I'm a writer first and a mixologist much, much later. And so I wanted to use a language about cocktails that we can taste, because the problem 
is most cocktail recipes, even most cocktail menus, are written by mixologists for mixologists. And when the average person goes into a bar or flips through a cocktail book and sees that a cocktail is made from creme de violette and benedictine and burdock root bitters, they have no idea what to expect out of that glass. And so I came up with this idea that, you know, flavor is on a spectrum and most cocktails fall into some cluster of characteristics along that spectrum. And so I figured out that there's probably about 11 primary characteristics that you could use to describe most cocktails, you know, starting with you know, refreshing and sweet and creamy and progressing to spicy and sour and kind of wrapping up with strong and warm. And, and that if we use words like that to describe cocktails, we actually have a really good sense of what's going to be in the glass before we ever reach for a bottle, before we go to the effort of making anything. It actually also helps us explore things that we didn't know we like, because when you drink something that is, let's say, uh, fruity and refreshing and a little spicy, uh, you realize you might also like something that's fruity and refreshing and a little bit sour. And it gives you an opportunity to explore cocktails that you didn't know you would like. And, and that's what I call the car cocktail cartography at the front of the book, where the cocktails in the book are charted out based on their primary and kind of secondary characteristics and to help people navigate through. And then the final thing I wanted to do with the book was kind of really harness the simple but potent tips and tricks that professional mixologists use that elevate their drinks. Because you know, at the end of the day, we can all make an old fashioned at home. It doesn't take a whole lot of skill to do that. But there are certain things that they do at high end bars that make the difference between an average cocktail and a craft cocktail. And I wanted to try to identify those techniques and tips and tricks that could apply to home. Uh, things like, for example, putting salt in your cocktail rather than on the rim of your cocktail glass. <laughs> you know, we, it's something that people don't think of, and yet at high-end bars, you'll often see them use uh, saline solutions by the dropper full. And there's a very good reason for this. Just like in our cooking, in our cocktails, salt elevates and rounds out the other flavors and the other ingredients, and it does the same thing in our drinks. And so it's a very simple thing. Anybody can grab a couple, you know, a pinch of a few granules of salt and throw them into a cocktail shaker. And it really does change the flavor of the drink, sometimes quite dramatically. And it's such a simple thing. Uh, you know, other things is reaching for unusual flavors that you don't necessarily expect to use in cocktails. The spice cabinet is a treasure trove of, of flavors that play well in cocktails. Things like miso, macadamia nuts, you know, unusual but perfectly adaptable ingredients. Um, speed infusions is another one. You know, one of the things that really sets a high-end bar apart is the mixologist will spend weeks, months crafting these infusions and bitters and, and, and their own kind of concoctions, which they then use to make cocktails. And I realized that you can actually do a very quick version of that at home because nobody's gonna spend a month making a cocktail for home. And so if you use your blender though, you know, cause of course, you know, uh, it's very common now to infuse a base liquor such as vodka or bourbon uh, with something flavorful, say lemongrass. And you, you know, you steep them, you let them sit for a month and then you strain it out and you use that liquor to make a, a cocktail. Well, if you throw those same ingredients in the blender, you chop them up for a few seconds and you let it steep for a minute and strain out the solids, you've got an infused liquor that you can make uh, a great cocktail with on the spot. And so that, you know, to me, those are kind of those game changing little tips and tricks that you can easily do at home. You don't have to have any special equipment, no special training, and doesn't take a whole lot of time. And, and that's what I really wanted to look for and, and kind of deploy in this book. Because to me, it was really important that these drinks feel different than just your average cocktail that you would make at home. I will say for the visual learner, I absolutely love the graphics in the book. I think that they're so well done, especially in the beginning. It's very like clear. And, and I know a lot of people, you know, you get a book and so much text and you're like, all right, I see that, but I need to be able to see that, you know? And I think that for someone like me who loves to be able to see things, it's so helpful and I think it's so well done just in the design.
Oh, thank you. I, you know, I was really adamant that uh, the book be illustrated rather than photographed. And, you know, one, there's a lot more flexibility in illustrations versus photography. But uh, two, I, I know this sounds crazy, but I've always felt like uh, cocktail photos look out of date the minute they're taken. For some reason, they all look, no matter what, they all look like they were taken in the 80s. And so I really wanted something that captured them in a very clean way, but that also kind of looked a little speakeasy-ish, but was really clear. And I didn't want any mysteries. I want you to know exactly what you're making. Yep, and I thought it was cool too, what we're getting into ingredients that you might not expect to tell our listeners what I'm drinking. I know I touched on this before we started, but I'm drinking a cocktail called the Pooh Bear, which includes two of the kind of different things that you would expect is butter and salt in it. So the recipe here in front of me is one tablespoon of butter, half an ounce of honey, four ounces of bourbon, a dash of orange bitters, and six to 10 grams of kosher salt. Uh, it was pretty easy to make overall. It took a little bit more time because you had to involve the freezer and stuff, but I mean, 10 minutes, 15 minutes of prep work and you have a delicious cocktail and it's a bigger one with the four ounces of bourbon. So you can sip on it a little longer. Yeah. I like my big cocktails. Um, <laughs> now, you know, that's a, it's a great technique that people at home don't ever think to do. It's called fat washing where you take a flavorful fatty ingredient in this case, the butter uh, combined with a little bit of honey and you, you melt the butter, you stir that whole thing into the, uh, into the bourbon and then you throw it in the freezer. Now the, the salt, soli I mean, sorry, the, uh, the fat solidifies and it's easy to scoop right off, but it leaves all that flavor behind. So you don't, you, you know, you think it might be kind of greasy or fatty, but it's really not. It's a very clean cocktail, but you've left behind that kind of buttery sweetness that is just fantastic in a cocktail like that. Definitely. <laughs> and I believe the, um, yeah, creamy and strong, the way that you're breaking it down with a really simple kind of ways to describe it. Uh, I noticed a lot of these cocktails here, you know, if not all of them, you have exactly sort of what you're going to be pulling out of, like the one above it here, the Green Mountain State, creamy, strong, herbal, sweet, uh, yeah. on a smaller note. So you kind of measure out what you're going to expect out of it. And I thought that was really cool too. Um, and obviously you can play around with these with whatever you have at home. So I went uh, Black Ridge bourbon is the bourbon that I have in this one. It was a pretty flavorful one, nothing crazy fancy or crazy high proof or anything. Um, but I figured it would play well with this and more of a creamy light note. Um, yep. Or you could go as crazy if you, you could make it even stronger if you dialed it up to something that's a higher proof or something. So the other cool thing is, although you spell out sort of, you know, use this, 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 and this, you just say bourbon. So yep. you can play with whatever you have. You're not saying, you know, use Woodford, use uh, Blaine's. Yeah, you know, I debated that for a while when I started working on the book. And I will say that as somebody who is, despite having spent the last 20 years of my career writing recipes, even writing the rules by which recipes are written in every American newspaper, I find it impossible to follow recipes. And I find it obnoxious when I flip open a book and it tells me I have to use a specific gin or a specific whiskey. And, and I understand why they're doing that. And but this is where I go back to, these are recipes written by mixologists for mixologists. They are really exacting folks. And they chose that gin because it has a particular botanical profile that they want in that drink and it plays well with the other flavors. I think that's awesome. And I will gladly shell out 15, 20 bucks for that drink at the bar. But when I'm at home, that's just not practical because if I flip to that page and I think, hey, that sounds like a great cocktail, Am I, because it prescribes a particular gin, am I not going to make it because I don't have that particular gin? I think that's kind of silly. I think people are going to gravitate to the gins and the whiskeys and whatever liquors they want that they like and that they have. And I think it gives people a little bit more freedom, like you say, to kind of explore and play around with things. There's only a handful of, of kind of specific brands that I call for, but that's because they're particular uh, liquors that it's just a kind of a one and done sort of thing. I think I have um, liquor 43, for example, which is a Spanish kind of vanilla spice liquor. I, and, and I should say the, the kind of second tier liquors that I call for, you know, top tier being things like bourbon and rye and tequila. Uh, the second tier kind of the auxiliary liquors that add a lot of flavor. 
uh, most of those are generic. You know, I call for orange liqueur, ginger liqueur, but some of them are very specific because they are just what they are. Benedictine, for example, is wonderful. Liquor 43. Um, that's probably, oh, Chinar is another great one uh, that I call for. And, and each one of them, I feel, brings something very special and different to the table in terms of uh, mixing. And so I didn't, you know, I didn't choose them randomly. I chose them because, well, if you're going to assemble a small bar and you're only going to have a certain number of bottles, then each bottle has to kind of earn its keep is how I felt. When it comes to those added in liquors, when somebody who is making your recipes and they don't you know, they're brand new to this. They don't have any of those mixers at all. Uh, they have to go get the basics. How do you suggest that they go about going to the store and finding things that are, you know, what they want to use if they are completely, you know, knowledgeless when it comes to those things? <laughs> yeah, you know, I always say go for the middle shelf. You know, top shelf is great for sipping neat uh, or, or on ice, but I rarely use top shelf stuff in cocktails because you're paying for nuances that in most cases you're going to blow away with whatever you're adding to it. And, but you also don't want to go for the bottom shelf because now you're just kind of messing with things too much. Uh, I think the middle shelf for most bottles spending anywhere between 20 and 30, 35 bucks a bottle is a really safe zone. And you can get some very decent liquors for mixing. And, you know, and the other thing to do is I've actually been, I've, I'll confess, I've never bought nips before. And I was at, so I live in New Hampshire where, you know, we have liquor stores on the highway because that's the sort of state we are. And we, I went into one of these massive liquor stores the other day and I was shocked by how many nips, I mean, like everything now. And, I, I mean, they're just like probably a thousand different liquors on for sale in, in these small little sample bottles. And that would, that is a perfect way to explore, you know, go in and, you know, drop 20 bucks and buy, you know, 15 of these things or whatever. And, and, you know, taste your way through a bunch of gins and a bunch of bourbons and ryes and see what you like. And, and that what you like will change and it may change based on what you're using it for. But it's a fun and inexpensive way of kind of exploring things. Yep, and it's a way to try a bunch of different ones a lot faster than my method of finish a bottle, go get a different bottle. And right, right. <laughs> over the course of a couple of years, you end up trying, you know, I, you know, a certain amount of bottles, but you try to think back, like, what was I, when was I drinking? What was that, that past couple months, you know? Right, um, so exactly. it's hard to really recall that. But if you know, like, oh, well, I have all these, or you have this array of them, and you know, oh, this one's good for that. That one's good for that. And you can try them. And then you can go and do the whole experiment again with the exact same ones for the same price instead of having to go buy a whole another 750 milliliter bottle. Right, exactly. And you can do, it's easier to do side by side with five different bottles, essentially, and, and, and see what you appreciate. Um, you know, the other thing, this, unfortunately, this is no longer COVID friendly, but a few years back, my uh, bunch of about 20, 30 people in my town here, we created a bourbon club. And it was a very simple principle that once a month we would get together, everybody had to bring a bottle to share and, and a little bit of money for charity. And, but it gave us an opportunity to try 30 different bottles of bourbon in one night. Well, maybe not all 30, but, and even a sip of those would probably do us in, but uh, it, but it was a great way to explore. So, you know, someday we'll be able to get together with people again and, and share bottles because it's another great way to explore what you like. And I have a question that I imagine a lot of other people have thought at some point, and that's what's the deal with egg whites in a cocktail and what, <laughs> why is that a key ingredient? Oh, it's an amazing ingredient. And I know it wigs people out totally, <laughs> uh, but it shouldn't, it really shouldn't. So egg whites uh, give cocktails a viscosity and a creaminess to them. And, and the first myth you have to dispel is that although they look slimy when you pour them into the drink, when you're finished mixing the drink, they're not slimy at all. There's just kind of a creamy richness to the cocktail. You only use about half an ounce for most cocktails, and uh, which is about, I think, a tablespoon. And, you know, it gives this kind of creamy viscosity to the drink and, and, and a body to it. And people, you know, don't appreciate the role texture plays in cocktails. And they think of texture as important in food, contrasting textures, but it's just as important in cocktails as well. And there's a million different ways to play with the 
uh, texture of a cocktail. You know, any everything from putting crushed ice in it to using jam to sweeten it gives it kind of a, a thickness of viscosity to obviously egg whites. And so egg whites contribute a lot in terms of that, that kind of mouth feel. It also contributes, uh, again, that kind of creamy taste. Now, the thing about using egg whites is it's important to always use it in an acidic cocktail, something that has some citrus juice in it, because the citrus juice helps emulsify the proteins in the egg whites. And that's gonna give you that kind of creaminess, that frothiness that you want in the cocktail. Um, now, I will say that my number one rule is I never actually use freshly cracked eggs. Uh, one, a lot of people have concerns about that for food safety. And two, I actually find they don't mix well in cocktails. I find that I don't get that kind of smooth emulsion that I'm looking for. And maybe it's just I've had bad luck with fresh eggs, but I've always found that carton egg whites are mix perfectly. They're also pasteurized, so they're safe to eat raw. And they're also easier to measure, frankly. You don't have to crack an egg and get a yolk out of it and figure all that out. Uh, I just, I find them much easier and they're, they're really wonderful. I mean, the classic drink they're used in is the Pisco Sour, which is Pisco, which is Peruvian brandy. And uh, usually lime or lemon juice is a bit of a debate about which one is more authentic. I like them both. And, uh, and egg white and a little bit of sweetener and you shake it up and you just get this kind of creamy, frothy, sweet, sour mix that's really wonderful. It's a great cocktail. Sorry, Nick, I thought you were asking no. a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another question that I have is for somebody who's new to cocktails at home and you're, I think your book does an incredible job of this. You do touch on it a little bit. Um, there are so many glasses, right? Like you can use so many different types of glasses and there are many, many, many available on the market from, you know, really plastic glasses to crystal glasses and everything in between. Yep. What, what is the importance of a glass when you're making a cocktail? And for someone at home, what are the, I would say three or so essential glasses that are good to have when you can't have every version? Right. Well, if, if I flip my screen here, you'll see I have a bit of a glassware problem. <laughs> I do have a lot of glasses. Uh, but so glassware matters and it doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter because the easy answer is it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, a, a cocktail is still a cocktail. And if you drink it out of a sippy cup, it's still going to taste delicious and it'll be fine. You know, I think people obsess about things like that too much. And if you, if your drink calls for a coupe or a cocktail glass and you only have a rocks glass, just make the damn drink and, and enjoy it. You know, don't get too uptight about it. That said, the style of glass does matter. And because the style of glass, uh, one, it, sometimes it's as simple as a volume. A drink is just a tall pour and it needs the volume of a, say, a highball or a Collins glass and just simply wouldn't fit in a rocks glass or, or a coupe. Uh, that's probably the easiest problem to solve. Uh, but there are other reasons to use a particular style of glass. And I, I have a coupe right here. And, you know, a coupe is uh, kind of very similar to a martini glass and kind of a bowl. It's kind of a squat wine glass. And originally, this actually was intended for drinking sparkling wine a uh, hundred or so years ago. And the reason for this, and the reason you should never actually drink sparkling wine out of a flute, except if you do, it's fine and do it and don't worry about it. But if you want to enhance your sparkling wine drinking experience, you actually want to use a coupe because the open mouth, the wide bowl of the coupe actually gives you more of an aromatic experience. Because you think about it, all those bubbles are coming up, they're popping, you want those bubbles to be in your face. And because as we know, a big part of flavor and taste is aroma. And so you want the bigger bowl because you're gonna experience more of the aromatic side of the sparkling wine and that's gonna enhance the drink experience. That said, if you only have flutes, use flutes. So if you were going to only have a handful of glasses, I guess I would say the most important to me are a nice rocks glass because so many cocktails are done in a rocks glass, especially brown cocktails. And, and you could certainly do any number of tequila based cocktails for no particular reason. There's no harm in not you know, doing those in a rocks glass. And then I would do a coupe. 
Uh, I like coupes over the more traditional V-shaped cocktail glass or martini glass. Uh, I think the body has um, a little bit more space and it's just easier to hold. I mean, it's, it's, simple, it's as simple as that. I tend to spill cocktail glasses every time I have a drink in them. And I like the lip on most uh, coupes better. And I would say if you had those two glasses and you know maybe a, a highball, but frankly, most people have highballs anyway. That's most people consider those water glasses. And so if you're gonna get specialty glasses, I just get a rocks glass and, and a coupe and I think you're good to go. It's funny you mentioned that. I just started getting a little bit more into the cocktail game recently and I got myself a you know cheap set of cocktail tools off Amazon, like the shakers yep. and strainers and everything. Uh, and I also got some glasses. Now I, I'm a whiskey guy. I have these tumblers all over the place. I have tons of these. Uh, I have pint glasses because beer is also rather like a big one with a handle on it or a big 16 ounce yeah. pour come out of a, you know, craft beer can. Um, and then I got some martini glasses mm. and I started making some martinis and I'm trying to balance. It's like a balancing yeah. act. Once you put follow in the recipe to exaction, it's like this glass is full and yeah, it's the most exactly. unstable thing with a light handle and a really heavy top. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing trying to yeah. drink out of. It's like a guessing game of when it's going to pour out the side too. But it does look pretty, and that's why people use them, I guess. It does look pretty. It's just not very practical. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I'll say I have. I'm, I'm not a glassware snob. I have a. I have a glassware addiction, but I'm not a glassware snob. I have one of my favorite rocks glasses. Actually, if you go to the grocery store and you buy the Glade scented candles, which uh, you know they're it's a squat glass, um, and you burn the candle, uh, it makes the best rocks glass. <laughs> <laughs> so I have probably 20 of those. <laughs> that's, a little, that's a little yeah. trick. You got a yeah. two in one with that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I love those. I actually found them at, at Goodwill, which also another great source for uh, inexpensive and really funky glassware. And I bought a whole bunch of them at Goodwill. They were empty. They, they didn't have candles in them. And I just thought, I actually thought they were glassware. And then I was in the grocery store one day. I just happened to look at the, the shelf and I saw these Glade candles and I was like, Ah, <laughs> and so it all came together. Another random question that I have that I'm not, I didn't catch this in the book, but I haven't completely finished it yet, is what is the real difference between a dry and a wet martini or cocktail? Um, a dry martini has no olive juice in it. And none of the brine, I mean, juice, olive juice, that sounds awful, doesn't it? It has none <laughs> of the brine in it. <laughs> And so, um, you know, and, and the wetter it is, the dirtier it is, it's kind of, meh. Um, I'm, I'm not a big martini drinker, to be honest. And it also, you know, you can also play around with the dryness and the wetness with the uh, vermouth, the dry vermouth is also a factor in that. It's not just the brine, um, because the brine is more the dirty and the vermouth is, is dry and, and wet. Um, but I'm not much of a martini guy. I like playing with the idea of a martini. I like playing with different flavor profiles of a martini, but uh, I'm not much of a straight up martini guy. So it's, it's fine, but it, I feel like it's always kind of disappointing. It never, it kind of just leaves me hanging. <laughs> yeah, I felt the same way. I got a gin for the first time not too long ago too, and I was stocking up that home bar. And I got the Hendrix, the dry gin oh, yeah. and some Martin and Rossi vermouth. So I tried different, I probably tried three or four different uh, gin martinis. And every time I always come back to a whiskey cocktail at the end of the day, yeah. that's my go-to. Yeah, I we tend to do mostly whiskey. Uh, I love, I think I told you guys the last show, I made one, the Vucare, which uh, is just, it's rye and Benedictine and cognac um, and sweet vermouth. And I love it. It's, it's like a sweet spot between an old fashioned and a Manhattan. And that is, that's just my go-to drink almost every night. And that or an old fashioned. Yeah, I love an old fashioned. I'll have to try getting into a whiskey cocktail with vermouth because I haven't tried that yet. Uh, and I saw there's definitely some in the book. So definitely. Yeah, some yeah the, uh, one of my favorites is the Philly Assault which is kind of a, uh, it's like a Manhattan, but it has uh, Chinar and Benedictine in it. And it's really good. I, that's another go-to for me. 
when you sat down to write the book, was there that one cocktail that you said, okay, this one is it, this has to be in here, but like maybe, you know, it's, it's, it's simple enough to make it home for the average person. But at the same time, it was like that one that you just like so much that it was just the pinnacle of the whole book. Oh, uh, boy, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I have to flip at the book for that. Um, you know, I, there was one that I, I loved the, and, and it was a bit of a struggle to get it right, the, tah, the tahini martini. It's, you know, it's another case of using ingredients that you never expect to see in a cocktail. And, and to me, it just kind of epitomized everything I was trying to do with the book because I really, again, it's simple. There's nothing complicated about this recipe. You know, it's, it's again, it's a fat washing where you're, you're flavoring the vodka with tahini and then you're just freezing it and you're scooping it out. Uh, but you're getting that kind of sesame nuttiness be left behind in the vodka. And, you know, when I made it, it was like, mm, no, this didn't work. Mm, no, this didn't work. Uh, it took me a few times to get it, but once it worked, it was like, yeah, this is perfect. It's got orange bitters in it and a little bit of lemon juice. And it was just like nailed it. It's like, it's like I said, I, I don't, I'm not a big martini drinker, but I like playing with the idea of a martini and taking it in all new directions. And this was like the perfect case where it starts out with something just basic martini, very simple, and pushes it in a whole new direction, whole new flavor profile, and, and just is a completely different experience. And, and it uses stuff that, you know, I mean, I know not everybody has tahini around the house, but you know, it's a common ingredient and it's certainly easy to find at every grocery store. And, and it just elevates, again, what could just be a basic martini, it elevates it, turns it into a craft martini. And that's, to me, that kind of captures the essence of the whole book. And on that, that's something I've always been curious about when crafting these cocktails, what's really the process and figuring out the proportions and everything that you need? Because to me, it's just a mystery when I look at it and I see <laughs> all right, this, 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 but what comes from a dash of the bitters, you know, how are you getting a half an ounce of this? You know, how do you play with those and how do you approach it from a standpoint of, all right, this is not quite right. What do I tweak here to make it better? So my joke has always been whenever, when all else fails, add salt or bitters, because <laughs> that seems to solve any manner of sins. But no, you know, I usually, I've learned after crafting now, you know, some 300 odd cocktails, uh, I've learned that most cocktails are too sweet and too sour and too much sugar and too much citrus juice, particularly lemon and lime, tends to blow out the other flavors in a cocktail. And so when I'm, when I'm crafting the cocktail, I try to be mindful of the dominant liquor, whatever it is, doesn't matter. And I, there's a reason you're putting it in the drink. And if you blow it away with all these other flavors so that you no longer know that it is that liquor, then you've kind of failed. To me, why are you drinking it? And so I try to always preserve kind of the, the integrity of the core liquor in the drink. And then what you're trying to do is balance that. And you're trying to draw on other flavors that are complementary and contrasting and that round out the whole experience in the glass. And so one thing, for example, I oftentimes with a, with a classic cocktail that we'll call for say citrus juice. I often find myself, myself I, I will start by putting it in because I'll, I'll you know, make a test run of it the way it's quote supposed to be made. And I will find more often than not that it's too sour and, or too sweet and sometimes both. And then I'll, I'll back it off. You know, if I started with half an ounce, uh, I'll back it off to a quarter ounce. And although these days I almost never go to a half an ounce because I've found over time, I just don't like that profile. I usually almost always start at a quarter ounce, but more and more what I've been finding is I don't want any juice at all, but that doesn't mean you can't get those flavors. And in fact, I was working on a cocktail last night that is a, it's a, an update to the Hemingway daiquiri, which the folks at Death and Company redid as a, they call it the high five, I believe. And they took the Hemingway daiquiri, replaced the tequila and the, the maraschino liqueur that are in a Hemingway daiquiri, replaced them with gin and Aperol. 
and it had, it's both versions of the drink had a lot of lime juice in it. And I, I tried it and I didn't care for it at all. And I made it a few times and then I realized as usual, it, it's just the lime juice is blowing away the other flavors. And I'm not able to appreciate them. And so instead I use a strip of lime zest. You rub it around the rim of the glass, you throw it into the glass, you pour your cocktail over it. And now you're getting the essence of lime, you're getting the flavor, but it's not changing the proportions of the drink. It's not changing the acidity or the sweetness of the drink. And it still conveys that lime flavor, that essence of lime uh, that was wonderful and nailed it. it, like it worked perfectly. So, I mean, to me, when I'm, when I'm playing with stuff like this, I'm always trying to find balance. I'm trying to make sure that the core liquor or liquors can, can shine through, aren't blown away by other things. I'm always trying to be mindful of adding things, much like every bottle has to earn its keep in my, in my, um, uh, sorry. No problem. There we go. Um, I'm trying to um, make sure that everything, uh, every bottle earns its keep uh, you know, and, and has a has a reason for being in the bar. Uh, every ingredient in a cocktail has to have a reason. So mm, as often as I can, there are plenty of times when I use a neutral sweetener because there's, there's plenty of times when that's just what's called for and that's what makes the drink the way it should. But I often, as often as I can, I will use sweeteners that add flavor as well as sweetness. And, and that's all part of, again, balancing the overall flavors of the cocktail. And rather than just add sweetness, why not add something that sweetens and flavors? And that's where a lot of those specialty liqueurs come in, you know, orange liqueur, ginger liqueur, because those are adding brightness and flavor and, and perceived acidity and, and sweetness. And that's kind of bringing a lot more to the table. So that's kind of the weird way of expressing the overall equation of what I do when I'm, when I'm making a cocktail. And sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's trying to work around what you might call the star ingredient. You know, if you've got a cocktail, I have one, I forget the name of it, that, uh, the, that has macadamia, or roasted chestnuts, the snowy London stroll has, you know, roasted chestnuts in it. You know, when you're, when you're trying to figure out how to balance that, you think, okay, we've got some creamy richness here, some nuttiness. So you've got savory and creamy and rich. You're gonna want something sharp to balance that. And so again, you could do, you could choose a juice, but I don't think that would work very well. I would be more in the favor of something like uh, orange bitters uh, or orange zest, because now you're getting those kind of bright flavor notes without actually competing with what you've already added to the cocktail. I have to say one of the most interesting ingredients and one of the cocktails that I'm most intrigued to try, I guess is that it's probably the best word because I have never had a cocktail with it, is the peas. You have a pea oh. pequila and a peas and thank you, which is yes. with wasabi, which is even more interesting. Well, so. you know, the wasabi peas, you know, the snack was the inspiration <laughs> for that. And yeah, you know, I was I was shocked by how well they worked because, you know, peas, you know, you think of them as kind of mealy and I don't know, not particularly flavorful, but they actually have a wonderful natural sweetness to them. And, and obviously you're not drinking peas, you strain them all out. They just leave their flavor behind. And, and it's, it's, but it's not a, like a grassy flavor. It's just kind of a natural kind of earthy sweetness. And that works really well. I, I was really surprised. And, and of course, wasabi, I love anything spicy. Um, I use, I have a, a handful of cocktails that that have just a subtle spiciness to it. You know, one of them has uh, cayenne, one has gochujang, the Korean fermented chili paste. Uh, some use sriracha and yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a fun way. You know, the, the thing about uh, spice is that it acts much like salt and it elevates the other flavors, kind of rounds them out and balances them. So uh, actually, if you ever wanna make the best mac and cheese of your life, doesn't matter what the recipe is, add a little bit of hot sauce to your cheese sauce when you're making it. And you not enough so that it's spicy so that you taste it, just enough that it's in the background because it's gonna elevate this kind of the savoriness and the creaminess of the cheese itself. 
and again, it works the same in a cocktail, just a tiny bit. Of course, sometimes, with like, especially with a tequila-based cocktail, you do want a little bit of the hint of spice. But adding just a bit, you know, again, you do get that kind of subtle spicy note, but you're also getting kind of this roundness to uh, the drink and, and it kind of ties it all together. It's, it's a neat trick. Yeah, salt and spice really does work to round things out. And I can think of a couple other examples like uh, with sourness or bitterness, like if you have a super dark chocolate and you add a little bit of chili or something to it, yeah. uh, it takes away some of that bitterness that you get out of a really dark chocolate and it really just enhances the flavor of the actual chocolate itself. And then also the only way I can eat a grapefruit, this is something that I've found to be pretty polarizing. Some people love grapefruit. Some mm -hmm. people hate it. If I try to eat grapefruit, the fruit straight away, I, I can't do it. I get this crazy pucker on my face just naturally out of nowhere. Uh, but what I do is I can actually put a little bit of Tabasco sauce on it. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah, a little bit of Tabasco and it rounds it out and it makes it a lot tastier and it takes away that bitterness because obviously with the spice, a lot of times it's not just the spice alone, especially with hot sauces. There's a lot of salt in those as well. So I'm right. sure that adds to it. And then the spice helps round it off and give it a little bit more flavor instead of just dumping salt onto something. That sounds really good. I actually salt my apples. It's something my great grandmother taught me and it's delicious. It's really good. <laughs> I always it's, put the salt on the tomatoes, but apples is new. Oh, I'd have to do that. <laughs> try it. It's really good. Uh, it, it, you know, it brings kind of a, a savoriness to the apple, but it's still very sweet and crispy and it's really wonderful. <laughs> and to get back into the theory and the cocktails too, and this is the last question I'll ask about that because I could go on it all day. Um, but can you give us a practical example of taking the primary ingredient like let's say we're taking a scotch what okay. are you going to approach in creating a cocktail that's going to balance that off to make it more approachable or drinkable as a cocktail without muddling out the scotch itself yeah you know and scotch is a good is a good uh one to ask about because scotch is a potent liquor and especially these days most scotches are so heavily peated and uh, you know that's a that is a potent ingredient and in flavor to to negotiate I find with scotch, you need some brightness and because scotch can be, can feel on the palate very heavy and, and all that smoke, all that peat and kind of weigh the drink down, it can be, feel like a very heavy drink. And I like to bring a little bit of balance to that. And one way is, is bright flavors. And so I have one drink called the Smoke Fiend where it uses ginger beer. And so now you've got your scotch, which is of course, again, a little bit heavier, a little bit peaty, and you're adding a little bit of ginger beer to it. And that's gonna add some sweetness to it. It's also gonna add the brightness, the sharpness, the acidity uh, of, of the fresh ginger. And, and that's a great interplay because what you don't wanna do, you wouldn't want to weigh it down. And you don't wanna add flavors that are going to, to take the drink down a notch. You want to kind of perk it up. And, and so that's, with scotch, that's kind of what I would do because I, I, I'm not a huge scotch fan. I love smoky flavors, but I've never been able to get myself around peat. And I, I, I have found one scotch that I like, uh, Monkey Shoulder. It's a very low peat scotch. And uh, that one I like, and that's actually my preference for using scotch in a cocktail. Uh, you know, I find that um, most others are just a little too strong for, for my taste. I also have one where um, I call it the Celtic coffee, but it's my take on, on an Irish coffee, which combines um, scotch and an Irish whiskey. And I and there might be one other thing in it, I forget. And, um, but it uses salt and obviously espresso to kind of balance out the, the kind of the heft of the drink and, and you know, the bitterness of the espresso is, help, is helpful in that too, because again, bitterness is, is kind of a perceived sharpness. And so you want something that's gonna kind of lighten it up because coffee itself, of course, is also heavy. And then you've got the heavy cream in that drink. And so that, one, that one's, a, that one's a, a challenging drink, but I, it is a good one. <laughs> And for everybody who didn't listen to the last episode yet, which we certainly hope they will, we'll definitely put the link to the, the first episode in the description because we learn a lot more about you and kind of some of your travels there. Um, where can everybody find you and where can they find the book online? 
Uh, so the book is available anywhere online where books are sold. If you want a signed copy, you can go to my Instagram and the link in my bio is to my local indie bookstore, which has arranged for signed copies and that they will ship anywhere. Um, I'm on Instagram and Twitter at, at JM underscore Hirsch, H-I-R-S-C-H. And yeah, I, I love Instagram. That's mostly what I use. And um, yeah. <laughs> and I know uh, you're just printing up these recently too, the actual finished copies of the book. When is the actual release date? When is it fully available? Is it out yet? It is not. It is. Are you ready? It's available November 3rd, a day we're all going to probably be drinking heavily. So I think the timing was just- That is convenient. So <laughs> <laughs> you can pre-order to pick it up on that day. Exactly. You know, if you order the Kindle copy, you can make them the same day. <laughs> well, you, you can pick it up on the third. You can you can go vote and then pick up your copy of Shake Strain Done and then go home and make a cocktail and wait. <laughs> <laughs> and you might be waiting longer than a couple of days this year. Yeah, probably. Luckily, All right. More than 200 recipes in there, so that'll hold you for a little bit. There you go. There we go. <laughs> yeah, it's such a great time talking to you again. I always love it. Uh, thank you so much for coming back on. We're looking forward to picking up some physical copies of the book so we can really get our hands on it. And now uh, we're looking forward to talking to you again in the future. Cheers. Sounds great. Cheers. Thanks so much for having me on. Follow us on social at Uncorked Corner and on the blog at uncorkedcorner.com for a taste of more food and beverage content. And if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave a comment, subscribe, rate, and review on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Thanks for listening.